Okay, it'd be great to start with maybe a little bit of an overview, if it's not too big an ask, of the, the sort of current telecoms industry. And I suppose particularly looking at both, you know, wired versus wireless, you know, just the what's going on in both of those areas. Of, yeah, just a sort of overview, if that's okay. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that we should probably kind of cover up. First, it's worthwhile before we start talking about wireless versus wired and hybrid and all that kind of thing is just an overview of the of the of the market. And I think it's I think telco is structurally challenged at the moment. Uh, I think the continuing demand for capital uh, and the investment that's required, not just for licensing, but also for the build out of those licenses, continues to be huge. Um, and I think the the appetite for consumers to pay a level of incremental cost, which is proportionate to the amount of incremental cash required to roll out those networks, I think is a challenge. Yeah, you know, I think basically they've got a uh, they've got a revenue versus uh, versus cost challenge, which makes it an incredibly tight place to operate. Which means they have to be really careful about where they're making their investments. Uh, and I think the markets reflect that as well. So it's very hard for them to raise incremental capital. So I think it's a it's a difficult place for them to be operating right now. The regulatory environment isn't kind to them either. Uh, and then I think the second structural thing which is difficult is the increased amount of competition, uh, not just from telcos, which continue to kind of cut each other's throats, but, but increasingly from hyperscalers who get into networks far, far, far more deeply. Uh, as well as things we're going to talk about today, you know, the the advent of um, of non-terrestrial networks, I think increasingly is going to be cutting into some of the more lucrative use cases that telcos have enjoyed. When we're thinking about fixed versus versus wireless, I think it's been a kind of an age-old debate. Um, I think that it's it's, a, it's very much horses for courses, depending on the depending on the use case. Although what I have seen over the last period is a, a, a reduction in the gap. I mean, when I was in Telco kind of 10 years ago, it was very clear on what a fixed network could provide against what a wireless network could provide. I think that gap's closed um, you know, fairly significantly. You know, four and 5G standalone networks, um, and then you have some of the, um, the LEO-based non-terrestrial networks increasingly can provide use cases which traditionally were provided only by you know, a high caliber fixed network. Yeah, and do you think the the enterprise market is comfortable and understands where, as you say, fixed fixed versus wireless, you know, where they have their place, or is there a little bit of a, I say, lack of understanding as to the potential of, I guess, particularly of, of wireless? I mean, why do I guess people are fairly comfortable with, but maybe the wireless more. I think on the on the fringes of use cases, I think it's really clear. Right? So if you're a trader um, and you the requirement is for really, really low round trip delay and, and latency, then you know you need a deterministic network. You know you need a kind of a point-to-point -point Ethernet network. It's fa it's fairly clear. I think where you're at places when you're doing things that are, you know, EPOS, I think you can understand that actually a wireless network is is fine. I think as you as you get closer and closer to the the main swathe of use cases, I think it's less and less clear. Um, and I think, I don't think the industry has done a great job of simplifying the number of solutions and exactly which solution is probably best place to answer a use case. Yeah, a great example would be some of the private network stuff that's done in, in ports. Uh, and some of that could be done with Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7, or you could do it with um, private networks, or you could do it with we are in different flavors of um, combinations of those networks. I think what the industry is doing is introducing complexity where there probably needs to be simplicity. You know, fewer solutions that are more aligned to use cases rather than a rush for more and more solutions. And in terms of the, I mean, I think you alluded at the top of the conversation a little bit about the, the costs involved, but um, whether it's digging holes in the ground building base stations, putting masks up and stuff like that. It's a fairly expensive, time-consuming business. But um, at least for now, or at least till recently, it was more, still the only game in town. So you, you you couldn't not do that. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair. It, it, and it is incredibly expensive, um, not just in terms of you know, capital cost, um, but in terms of the amount you have to invest to get the regulatory approval and the local planning approvals 
um, in order to, 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 to pull up sites. I mean, telcos have got a, a tough job. On the one hand, they get consumers complaining about lack of coverage, but those same consumer groups often complain about having a, you know, a mass directed you know, to, 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 in their eyesight. So they want the service without some of the cost that comes with the service. And I think that's, I think that's difficult. I think 99% of the places that are easy to get to have been got to. Um, and of that, I think 90% you know, of the use cases are met. It's just those use cases on the fringes, those geographies on the fringes, um, where it's incredibly difficult for a telco that is strapped in terms of this capital, um, access to capital, um, it, operating in a really difficult regulatory regime in pretty much all of the European markets to be able to make it cost effective to get to all of those, um, all of those broader geographies. So, yeah, I don't think that realistically um, any amount of, uh, of government based initiatives to get fixed fiber or mobile um, capabilities into some of those um, challenging areas is going to be fruitful. I think you need to look for different solutions. OK, and that's where we perhaps move the conversation on to the future terrestrial is one thing but the sky or space um is maybe the future for now so and it'd just be good to understand what's changed about that because I, I guess once upon a time it would have been prohibitively expensive so you know a non-starter but what has changed to, to make this more of a, a you know, potentially exciting option i mean a couple of things really felt i think first of all when we think about uh kind of legacy space-based communications we're talking about you know, geosynchronous satellites, and they're at it like 36,000 kilometers from space, from, from the Earth. Uh, and the round trip delay on that is pretty huge. And the cost of putting a satellite out there is pretty vast. So when a consumer would think about using satellite-based communications, they needed very specific hardware, and also very, very deep pockets to be able to take advantage for that. So the number of use cases where that would work is very, very small. But, but that's fundamentally changing. Um, there's been a massive drop in ride share costs. So whereas previously, I think the space shuttle used to spend about $85,000 per ton getting something into um, what, would, what would be around right about low Earth orbit. Now it's about $6,000 a ton. And the price of that is falling year on year on year. Um, so it's, it's very easy to build out constellations in low Earth orbit. And to give you some context, low Earth orbits, you know, between 500 kilometers and about two and a half thousand kilometers above, above the Earth. So if you've got a golf ball, cut it in half. The white bit is probably where, probably where low Earth orbit is. That's got enormous advantages um, in that it's, it's cheap to get to. Um, so you can put up multiple satellites. And you've already seen when you put up multiple constellations. And they need to be constellations because one of those satellites is only in view for about four minutes. Um, when you put up vast constellations, you can get huge amounts of data um, up to them and down to them at a very, very reasonable cost. Um, you're not talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, I know customers that are using um, Starlink, for example, for this for their small business, uh, and it's costing them $180 you know, a, a month um, for pseudo enterprise grade service uh, and availability. So that's fundamentally changed where things were, you know, five five years ago, and that's only going to expand. Okay. And in terms of the potential, I mean, is it still fairly early days for for this kind of technology, or is it already maturing as a market? So I guess the but the question the other way is 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 much of the enterprise aware of what's possible with this technology, or is it still they're still thinking? Well, it all sounds a bit sort of newfangled and untried, so we need to you know sit on the sidelines for you know six months and a year and and just see what's going on. Yeah, I think the I think the technology is well tested. I don't think there's anything particularly complicated in the in the technology. Um, I think it's about scale, right? So what have you got? About eight and a half thousand satellites um, in in low Earth orbit. Um, there are constellations being set up year on year on year, so that's going to grow. So I think about I think it's about getting to scale. Uh, when it's a scale, then the coverage will be not just better in terms of the amount of bandwidth available, but it'll be better in terms of its uh, its availability and its resilience. And then I think what we'll see is uh, what was a uh, quite a discrete use case will start expanding. So you might have a small SME that's kind of 
20 employees that can be served, that'll start to become 50 and, and broader and broader. And as you get more and more IoT capability in space, I think you're going to find that they start eating into that as well. You know, I saw a study only recently that said that by 2027, they're expecting the kind of non-terrestrial data communications networks to be worth around about 37 billion. Well, that, that's not new money. Right? That's not people that all of a sudden realizing they want to spend more on data. That's coming out of somewhere, and that's what the telcos have to get their heads around. You know, what's their place in a market that's got the hyperscalers starting to dominate um, in, in fixed, and you've got some of the the, the video um, communications operators starting to dominate direct direct to sell with the consumers. And it, it's not hard to hypothesize if you get yeah Amazon and their their Kuiper project, they'll have a direct to sell capability. It wouldn't be the the biggest leap for them to start to put kind of ground stations co-located with their data centers. And you've got a really interesting, exciting enterprise proposition um, for parts of the um for parts of the use case. Yeah, I suppose the the, the question as as earlier when we were talking about wired versus wireless and enterprise, you know, grade um opportunities, it how enterprise fit i guess are is satellite technology or you know this brand of satellite technology in terms of mission you know you say data centers you know clearly if data centers something goes wrong every, the world kind of stops so are, are these yeah. new technologies yeah. going to be capable of, of carrying the kind of traffic that is mission critical or would, again will it just be less critical applications etc that are that are operated that just your thoughts i suppose I think when it's a scale, I think more and more enterprise mission critical um, use cases could move to, to non-terrestrial networks. But I think as ever, and it sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer, but it's going to be a hybrid. Um, I think many enterprises will start to use this as a resilient, a genuine resilient solution. Um, normally, when we talk about you know, resilience into a, into a data center, it's not unusual to find that those two diverse fibers go down the same bit of trunking at some point in the network journey and that resilience just evaporates. Um, 4G and 5G are never going to provide the amount of um, uh, bandwidth to be able to provide genuine resilience. I think a, a sensible enterprise with mission critical communications where they were, they were looking for things like Ethernet, you know, could well start to consider a totally resilient backup being via, being via satellite, particularly as we get to scale over the coming years. And in some use cases, I think it could move faster. So I generally think that you know, things like IoT, um, space-based IoT, I think solves a lot of problems that, that terrestrial network IoT are facing, um, specifically around things like um, you know, roaming. So if you have a, you, you need lots and lots of individual roaming agreements, if you've got a, a piece of IoT equipment that is globally mobile, well, of course, if you have a, a satellite capability, which is global, then you have one contract uh, and you're able to provide that kind of level of um, that level of service much, much more simply, particularly when it's using tiny amounts of data. So I think we're going to find some use cases moving much, much quicker than others. I think, as I said, I think resilience and diversity, the growth in SME and small business using it as a primary, and then things like IoT, I think will be much, much faster. And then there will always be a part of the market which does need a great big fat pipe going from A to B to be able to guarantee that amount of speed, that amount of resilience, and that amount of availability. And are there any? I mean, you mentioned sort of obviously the building out of of uh, satellite based based um, networks, but are there any other significant challenges that need to be addressed before it becomes or you know, gains significant momentum, or the technology works? So it is just literally a question of how quickly, whether as you say it's the hyperscalers, telcos, whoever it is. Can, can build out these constellations? Yeah, I think there, listen, there are a number of challenges, not just the ones that are very visible, right? When you kind of see how hard it is to get something into space. It looks like SpaceX have got this kind of work through for, for what they're doing, but also, you know, we know that the, the Kuiper project is developing. There are a number of projects in China. That's not an easy activity by itself, but that will get simpler. There are some things I think which, uh, you know, are difficult obstacles that need to be overcome or certainly need to be understood. Uh, first of all, I mean, things like space weather. Um, you know, when there is a solar mass ejection, which happens more frequently than we'd, we'd like to think, 
yeah, that has a fundamental impact on the ability of satellites to be able to operate. Um, and so that's a, that's a thing to, to, to understand. Any disturbance in the ionosphere massively impacts the ability for us to, to be able to transmit and receive these kinds of signals. But also, let's not forget that you know, in, in low Earth orbit, there are eight and a half thousand kind of satellites. There's about 160 million pieces of debris. I know, admittedly, some of those are kind of two millimeters in size, uh, but they're traveling at, what, 15, 15 kilometers a second. So one of the things that has to be thought about is exactly where all these satellites are uh, and how they can be made sure that they're operating in a way which is com completely safe. Because, you know, that if you invest everything in low Earth orbit, uh, it, it's a, it is a hostile environment out there. Um, in in that in that part of space, it's going to become increasingly congested uh, and an increasingly difficult place to operate in. Yeah, and you mentioned um, just a brief briefly about the sort of hybrid world that we'll will end up with. I'm just wanting clearly wired, fixed wired for various things, as you explained, is always going to be required. But I'm just wondering whether the um, the, the satellite based comms if you like might significantly eat into you know the the traditional 5g and 6g wireless on the base i mean for example where yeah i'm in wiltshire and i can barely get 3g let alone 4g sometimes so you know somebody does something with a satellite presumably that might help me out a lot etc just your thoughts i suppose and, and as we know in developing countries i think they go straight to satellite without you know so just your thoughts i suppose on the wireless side of things how satellites will exist alongside you know, the existing uh, networks? I absolutely think there are there are use cases of geographies where satellites got a role. I'm, I'm like you, I live in Wiltshire. I suffer the same thing that, that you suffer. Uh, and all of my communication is done via um, by Starlink. Uh, and it, so it's completely replaced my reliance on, 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 on mobile. Uh, equally, when I'm making a mobile call, I'm doing it on WhatsApp. WhatsApp. I'm doing that again by by the satellite, and there's no difference in the in the experience. There is actually a, a difference in the availability in that I've had one outage in 18 months that lasted 4.3 seconds. That's it. So there's a. Um, I think there were increasingly there will be use cases. I think increasingly as we get to scale, the cost base will be will reduce, uh, and we will see direct competition between some of it. A bit of a think of a vote Venn diagram. Um, there will be some 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 encroachment, but for the main, I think they can they can work as happy bedfellows. Uh, I do think there is a there is a a happy relationship um, between some of the mobile operators and some of the space capability that helps them get to low or no coverage areas in a much more efficient way. And if you're a telco wanting to offer ubiquitous service. Um, it's it's certainly an option with it that you would go to be able to you would be able to guarantee that in a way you never could with uh, with with four G five G and increasingly six G um, where they're trying to get more and more data through a smaller and smaller wavelength which means it has less and less reach so I think they can they can operate together and we've already seen you know collaborations between you know SpaceX and T Mobile. Uh, we've seen collaborations between AST and um, and Vodafone. There's, there's, I think we should see more and more of that coming out. I think the telcos need to be careful there. You know, there's a they're dancing with the devil there, uh, and I think in many cases we might see they might see more and more encroachment and more and more revenue erosion than perhaps they were expecting in their initial business case, uh, and they find themselves in this increasing squeeze between very ambitious, high growth organisations like Amazon and SpaceX on one side, and organisations like you know, Microsoft and Google are squeezing them from the hyperscalers um, side. So they've got a very, very careful road to navigate, I think. And presumably from an end user point of view, we'll end up, as, as I think you've explained there, in a scenario where your comm supplier, your connectivity supplier, to a certain extent, you don't really care how you're connected, you know, whether they're using, you know, 5G, satellite, etc. You, As long as you're service works then you don't care what's going on under the covers is that where we're going to arrive at at some some stage in the future well i think that i think you hit the nail on the head that is the that is the perfect value proposition for for mobile uh, mobile providers to say to their customers don't worry about that this is a really complex world and hands up we've made it more complicated in the way that we give everything an abbreviation 
But what we will do is take all of the, we'll take all of that complexity away, and we'll just guarantee that you're connected to the person you want to be connected to, wherever that is. And we'll do it with a single cost base and a single experience. And it, we will transition you beautifully from you know a Wi-Fi call inside a building onto a 4G, 5G network, onto a non-terrestrial network and back again in a single end-to-end -end call if we, if we needed to. That is a great value proposition for customers that just want some things to be simple. They want things to be available. Uh, they want things to be secure. That's all that's all a customer wants. And that will be a very, very unique proposition. Easily said, it's more difficult to deliver when you've got multiple different components and multiple diff different technologies building that, that fabric of simplicity for a consumer. But I guess the, the message is for consumers, if not now, at least in the nearer future, they should make sure that whoever's providing them with their, their comms connectivity, um, they shouldn't necessarily put up with, you know, whether it's poor service or, or you know, some, some downtime, they should be able to or know that, you know, it is possible to do much of what we've discussed at maybe not quite so seamlessly now, but at some stage. So therefore, they should maybe push back slightly if they're not getting the quality of service that they think they deserve. Is that, is that fair to say? I think certainly enterprise customers that have a much bigger voice should be um, should be asking that that the, the telecoms provider for their roadmap and how they're going to start to integrate these services to create something that's seamless and simple. Uh, I think that's I think you know, previously they, the battleground was around you know bandwidth uh, or bandwidth and price point. I think simplicity will be a a real battleground, uh, and the the simpler that that that, uh, that organisations can make their service to customers so that it just works and they haven't got to think about, I think that'll be a great rallying sergeant for, um, for, for customers, both consumer and, uh, and enterprise, because they crave simplicity. They don't want the complexity. They don't want it to be offloaded to them to make decisions on what type of network for what application. They just want it to work. They want it to work in a way that's secure. They want it to work in a way that's consistent with what they're trying to drive as a business value, so how fast it is and available it is. Uh, and they want the telco to take that problem away from them. Just make that work for me. Uh, and then I, I'm happy to pay whatever premium you want to attach to that. But make it simple, make it quick, and make it simple. And I'm guessing in the same way that MSPs are gaining quite a lot of traction because they're managing a lot of the complexity for their customers, presumably communication service providers, which I, I know obviously already exist, but they pot potentially will have a bigger role to play in the in this new world of putting together the different types of um, you know, networks out there. Is, is, is that a likely scenario? Yeah, I think they're perfectly placed to be able to do that. I think they understand the technology, they understand the customers, they've got the kind of the global reach and the global outlook. So, you know, if if not them, who? Um, and I think they've got a um, more than just a, an opportunity, I think they've got an obligation to, to, to take all these myriad of different technologies, to boil them down, and to create something for customers which is yeah, simple, seamless, and secure. Okay, and maybe just just finally, it'd be good to understand um, Spire. What where where does Spire and fit into this um, rapidly uh, evolving world? What 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 is it that you bring to the party, if you like? Well, I think the um, the the ironic thing is simplicity isn't simple. Right. Underneath the, the most simple of processes uh, or simple of offers comes a huge amount of complexity. Um, Spirant is a world leader in being able, to, being able to test, being able to test not just the telco elements, but also the non-terrestrial elements as well. We've a, we've a, we've a deep, deep track record in, uh, in doing that with a customer base that stretches from the largest telcos to the largest space providers. So I think that we have a we have a role to play as an in, independent um, uh, entity that's able to test the end-to-end -end customer experience. How does it feel? How does it feel for a customer under load? Uh, will, does, it, does it still work when parts of the network drop out? Um, are there resilient strategies still going to make sure that they provide the end user experience that they priced? So if they if a if a telco wants to make a promise around service assurance, they need to test and design for service assurance. And we're perfectly placed because we're the world leaders in exactly that. Okay, oh, we've had a pretty wide ranging conversation. It was absolutely fascinating to 
understand what's going on and, and the, the future. And maybe we can catch up again second half of the year and see what else has, has happened in the meantime, because it seems pretty fast moving. But Lisa and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Great to talk to you. Speak soon. Thanks again.